the haunted house. One time a preacher went to see if he could put a haunt to rest at a house in his settlement. The house had been haunted for about 10 years. Several people had tried to stay there all night, but they would always get scared out by the haunt. So this preacher took his Bible and went to the house, went on in, built himself a good fire and lit a lamp, sat there reading the Bible. Then, just before midnight, he heard something start up in the cellar, walking back and forth, back and forth. Then it sounded like somebody was trying to scream and got choked off. Then there was a lot of thrashing around and struggling. And finally, everything got quiet. The old preacher took up his Bible again. But before he could start reading, he heard footsteps coming up the cellar stairs. He sat watching the door to the cellar. And the footsteps kept coming closer and closer. He saw the doorknob turn, and when the door began to open, he jumped up and hollered, What do you want? The door shut back easy-like, and there wasn't a sound. The preacher was trembling a little, but he finally opened the Bible and read a while. Then he got up and laid the book on a chair and went to mending the fire. Then the haunt started walking again, and... the cellar stairs. The old preacher sat watching the door, saw the doorknob turn and the door open. It looked like a young woman. He backed up and said, Who are you? What do you want? The haunt sort of swayed like she didn't know what to do. Then she just faded out. The old preacher waited, waited, and when he didn't hear any more noises, he went over and shut the door. He was sweating and trembling all over, but he was a brave man, and he thought he'd be able to see it through. So he turned his chair to where he could watch, and he sat down and waited. It wasn't long before he heard the haunt start up again, slowly. Closer, and closer, and closer, and it was right at the door. The preacher stood up and held his Bible before him. Then the knob slowly turned, and the door opened wide. This time, the preacher spoke quiet-like. He said, in the name of the Father the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Who are you and what do you want? The haunt came right across the room, straight to him, and took a hold of his coat. It was a young woman aged about 20 years old. Her hair was torn and tangled, and the flesh was dropping off of her face so he could see the bones and part of her teeth. She had no eyeballs, but there was a sort of blue light way back in her eye sockets and she had no nose to her face then she started talking it sounded like her voice was coming and going with the wind blowing it she told how her lover had killed her for her money and buried her in the cellar she said if the preacher would dig up her bones, and bury her properly, she could rest. Then she told him to take the end joint of the little finger from her left hand and to lay it in the collection plate at the next church meeting, and he'd find out who had murdered her. And she said, If you come back once more after that, you'll hear my voice at midnight, and I'll tell you where my money is hid and you can give it to the church. The haunt sobbed like she was tired, and she sunk down toward the floor and was gone. 
The preacher found her bones and buried them in the graveyard. The next Sunday, the preacher put the finger bone in the collection plate, and when a certain man happened to touch it, it stuck to his hand. The man jumped up and rubbed and scraped and tore at that bone, trying to get it off. Then he went to screaming like he was going crazy. Well, he confessed to the murder, and they took him to jail. After the man was hung, the preacher went back to the house one midnight, and the haunt's voice told him to dig under the hearth rock. He did, and he found a big sack of money, and where that haunt had held on to his coat, the print of those bony fingers was burned right into the cloth. It never did come out. Mirror of the Night Thunder made a fitting accompaniment. Sonorous echoes rolling from the surrounding hills. The fitful glare of lightning dancing like silver ghosts on the shadowed peaks. Savage brilliance which threw into sharp detail the massed vegetation, the winding road, the branches which, almost meeting from side to side, made a laced canopy overhead and enhanced the gothic mystery of the terrain. One Stephen Aldcock appreciated and would have used earlier in his career. It gave an added dimension to the trip he was making into the Appalachians, following narrow, unmarked, and near-forgotten roads, the wheels of the car bouncing into ruts, the sides lashed by hanging fronds. A journey Diane wasn't enjoying. She hadn't spoke since he'd switched off the radio. Trying to argue, she had met defeat and now sulked in silence, wreathed by a haze of smoke. Yet he had been right to insist. The region held an atmosphere of its own, and the noise had been a distraction. Glancing at her, he tried to explain. We're traveling back in time, he said. Into the past where people live close to nature. This region has hardly changed since the settlers first came. Try to imagine it, he urged. They had to move along narrow paths, winding between scattered habitations. These woods would have sheltered all kinds of danger, and travelers would have been attacked, ripped, clawed, shot, stabbed, left to lie bleeding on the ground. Think of being injured, lying out there in the woods with night closing in, just as it is now. Hurt, knowing you're alone with death very close. Knowing, too, that something could be watching you. Something inhuman. You're sick, she said. Crazy. It happened. Sure it happened. She lit another cigarette. No matter what you imagine somewhere, at some time, it has happened. So people died out here. So what? Can't you feel it? The atmosphere? The magic? I feel cold, she snapped impatiently. I feel hungry and tired and cramped. I need a good meal, a bath, a warm bed. How much longer are you going to amuse yourself by dragging me around these godforsaken roads? She had no imagination, but he had known that when he married her. Then it hadn't seemed important, and he had traded compatibility for appearance. She had dazzled him with her physical beauty, and he had lusted after the prize. Now, too often, he regretted it having won it. Patiently, he said, Try harder, darling. Look at these hills, each as old as time. Listen to the thunder. Feel the atmosphere of the place. It's odd, strange, as if aliens had landed here eons ago and performed mysterious rites to unknown gods. See! He pointed to a distant rift, one suddenly touched by the glare of lightning. Beyond that cleft could lie a forgotten village in which, at each sunset, a sacrifice is made. A hen or a rat, maybe. But once a year, something larger. A dog, or a goat, even a girl. A real, live, unblemished virgin. Stop it! You wouldn't qualify, of course, not as a virgin. But they'd settle for your beauty. She snapped, savagely. That's enough of this stupid talk. Writers are supposed to be a little crazy, but this is too much. If you're trying to frighten me, you're wasting your time. Now let's get back to civilization and find a decent motel. It wasn't that easy. As the night closed around them, he realized they were lost. 
The road he followed branched into smaller tracks, and, choosing one at random, he drove down a path on which it was impossible to turn. As Diane complained, he said quickly, This must lead to a farm. When we reach it, there'll be room to turn. Just sit and relax. Several minutes later, without warning, the path opened to reveal the totally unexpected. No! Breaking, he leaned forward to stare at what lay ahead. I don't believe it. A house! Stephen, it's a house! A mansion set against a wall of trees. A tall building with twisted chimneys and arched windows, now illuminated by the glare of headlights and the flashes of lightning accompanying the growing fury of the storm. An old house that squatted like a decaying beast beneath sagging eaves, one with warped frames and scabs of leeching, flaking bricks and moldering tiles, the relic of a bygone age, the path they had followed the remains of a once-tended drive. A house, she said again. There must be people. Then, as he made no effort to move, see if we're welcome. Find out where we are. Ask if you can use the phone. She had turned on the radio by the time he returned. The sound fuzzed and distorted. Thunder rolled as he switched it off. As it faded, she said, Well, no luck. What? The place is empty, he explained. Deserted. I couldn't get an answer and saw no signs of life. It must have been abandoned years ago. We'll have to keep moving. The car moved forward as he engaged the drive, swinging wide to avoid a pool, straightening to sweep the house with searchlight clarity. Wait! Diane caught at his arm. I saw something in an upper window. A face. It looked like a face. He grunted, making no comment, fighting the wheel as the car skidded towards the pool. Rain hammered on the roof, gushed over the windscreen, churned the ground to mud as the storm, breaking, filled the air with noise and fury. Abruptly, he braked and cut the ignition. Stephen! We'll have to take shelter in the house. This rain will wash out the roads. If we get wrecked, no one will ever find us. Get to the door. I'll follow after I switch off the lights. Can't you leave them? And run down the battery? Not a chance. The lightning will guide us. Hurry! She ran, long legs flashing, her coat lifted to protect her hair. He followed after, collecting the bag of provisions from the boot. Cans of meat, crackers, pickles, pate, and some wine. Items picked up at a local store as a bribe in return for directions. A place a county away now. A world. The door, sheltered by a weathered portico, had defied her attempts to open it. With sudden impatience, he lifted his boot and slammed it against the lock. Wood splintered, yielded beneath a second onslaught, the door opening with a creak of hinges. Air gusted out from the dark interior, chill, tainted with a sickly odor. Quick! Stephen led the way inside. Inside! Lightning illuminated the interior with stroboscopic flashes. A wide hall, bare boards, stairs that wound upwards. Doors that were closed, a box on which rested a stub of candle. It flared to life as Diane set fire to the wick. From the walls, faces stared with brooding hostility. Lifting the candle, Stephen examined the framed portraits. All were of men and bore a common likeness. The jowls heavy, the lips full, the chin deeply cleft. Some wore wigs, others had ribboned hair. Some were proudly bald. Their eyes seemed to move in the flickering light. It's cold, Diane shivered. Can't we light a fire? Not here. The gaping fireplace held nothing but dust and wind, carried rain through the open door. I'll look upstairs. Shut the door and find the lights. There were no lights. The house had never been wired for electricity or piped for gas and any lamps had long since vanished. There were no more candles, but Stephen found a bowl of grease that held a wick. It threw a guttering light and emitted a noisome odor. Hastily, he extinguished it. We'll make do with the candle. There's a room upstairs with the fireplace and a few chairs the looters didn't take. 
they'll do for fuel. Looters? Owners, then. I don't know. Whoever cleared this place. Relatives, friends, debtors, thieves. Who can tell? He paused on the stairs and looked at the portraits. This must have been a family home, but they died out long ago. No modern costumes, you see. The land gave out, and the money, and the workers would have left. The owners would have clung on from habit and pride. A decaying aristocracy, drifting into incest, perversion, degeneracy, winding up as idiots, dying out in the end. It's an old story. Diane said, thoughtfully, Why didn't they sell the portraits? If they had to get rid of everything else, why keep them? Why leave them here? For the same reason you leave headstones in a graveyard. Fear. Respect. This was their home, remember? In a way, it still is. Chuckling, he added, I've got an idea. Let's invite them to dinner. Take them upstairs. It'll add to the adventure. Come on, darling, help me. No. She didn't want to touch the portraits. Do it if you must. I'll start the fire and set the table. There was no table. Only a section of the floor. The bright labels of the provisions, a glaring contrast to the warped and time-stained boards. The wine had come with plastic cups. Stephen poured, solemnly lifted his container, and bowed to the row of faces he had set against the wall. To your very good health, my lords, I salute you. Diane watched, not amused. It was more idiocy to add to the rest. The tiresome journey, the search for ancient places, his interest in the house, the ridiculous urge that made him bring in the moldering portraits into the room. Not all of them. Most remained still in the hall, but those he had chosen seemed to have a special vibrancy. Here, he even offered her one. It's your turn to make a toast. Must I? Not if you don't want to, but drink it anyway. It'll help you to relax. Accepting the container, she stepped towards the window and looked out into the night and the storm. It had yet to ease and distant flashes walked on the hills and thunder echoed like gunfire. She drank and turned. Quickly, suddenly startled. Wine splashed over her hand. Is there something wrong? Stephen, at her side, was concerned. It's, it's nothing. I just, it's nothing. You saw something, he said. Look. Turning her to face the window, he said. You saw me, my reflection. Did you think I was a ghost? Pale against the night he could have been, but if so, she was another. Reflections caught in the mirror the window had become. Two figures, almost of an equal height, his thinner, older, hers making no secret of her sex. As she watched, she saw his hand rise, move, felt the touch of his fingers the pressure of his flesh, the yielding of her own. My darling, he murmured, you are beautiful. A long moment in which she felt herself begin to respond, then the glare of lightning destroyed the reflections, and the blast of thunder made the floor quiver and the flames dance in the grate, flames that died as the candle died. Damn! Stephen poked at the embers. I can't eat in the dark. We'll have to use the bowl, the one filled with a rancid grease which yielded an odor which now oddly seemed less repugnant than earlier. By its light, he opened cans and packets and dispersed the food. Eating, he looked at the row of painted faces, again lifting his container of wine in a silent toast, one in which Diane refused to share. The faces were too alive, the eyes gloating as they followed her every move, the lips moist the teeth gleaming. Stephen, they're horrible. Turn them to the wall. Why? Don't you like an audience? What do you mean? Damn you, answer me! Her anger startled him. Mean? Nothing. It's just that you're fond of making an entrance. To be the center of attention. Most beautiful women are. Like flowers, they love the sun. Flattery but she was worthy of it. And was it flattery to tell the truth? 
She was beautiful and sitting on the floor before where she sat in the only remaining chair. He could appreciate the curved perfection of her body. Mentally, he assessed it as the wine warmed him with a pungent glow. Stephen! Diane was staring at him, her mouth tense. Your eyes! Is there anything wrong? No. Your expression! I've never seen you look like that. What's the matter? Nothing is the matter. I was just looking at you and thinking of the early days of our marriage and remembering just how lovely you are. Smiling, he reached towards her, touched her, fingers running over the smooth contours of her calves and thighs. You look wonderful, darling and was wonderful in a variety of ways. He felt her withdraw from the touch of his hand as his mind filled with bizarre images. What games had the owners played? Isolated in the hills, how had they amused themselves? Bonded servants chased and slaughtered in a travesty of the hunt? Nubile girls tormented, beaten, whipped, flayed, and used as objects of sexual gratification? Things easy to believe. The painted faces held the demented perversion. What would they have thought of Diane? Her physical attraction? Stephen! Her tone snapped him from his reverie. Sorry. He found the wine and drank from the bottle, ignoring the cups as he did the portraits. I was thinking about something. Tell me about it. This is a vacation, darling, so why not enjoy it? Rising, he moved to stand behind her, his hands dropping to her shoulders, moving lower in an intimate caress. Two people, he whispered, lost in the hills, an old deserted house, the storm, a perfect setting for them to perform the act of love that confirms their union. Please, darling, I need you. Are you crazy? Twisting in his arms, she glared her distaste. You want to use me? Here! Not on your life! Ow! Once, she hadn't been so particular. His hands cradled softness as thunder blasted the air with enough force to shake the window. See, my darling? The gods are with me. They demand we perform the ancient rite. You're drunk. I've had a drink. He had admitted, but that has nothing to do with it. I want to make love to you, here and now. His fingers closed with sudden, hurtful strength. Damn it, woman, you're my wife! Don't be an animal! She rose, breaking his grasp as she stepped aside. You think I'd do that? On the floor? Before them? She gestured at the portraits, her painted nails looking as if tipped with flame. Look at them! Degenerates! Filthy lechers! Scum! They're only paint and canvas. If you want, I'll turn them to face the wall. Won't that spoil your fun? She glared her anger. Is that what you really want? To have the others watch me while you kiss and grope and slobber? You disgust me! Get out! You drunken pervert! Get away from me! Leave me alone! He went with the wine, weaving down the stairs and into the hall, the gloom, the watchful eyes of the painted faces, to a window where he stared into darkness, his features reflected in the pane, to a spot on the floor where he sat and leaned his back against the wall, to finish the wine, to close his eyes, to sleep, to dream. The house became alive with whispering susurrations. Figures moved, stepped from their frames, followed the steps of an elaborate saraband. All were men, no women. This house belonged to men, and he felt a part of it. He had returned to something he had once known, a companionship that embraced him with its comfort. The storm murmured in the distance 
walking the sky on feet of lightning, talking in the voice of thunder. He stirred in his sleep as the dream turned to nightmare. The figures became ghosts, which merged into him, sinking into his body as if he were a sponge absorbing their souls. They became him, and he became a host to them all. Together they roved through the house, and as they roved, hunger came to join them. A blast, and the house shook to the dying fury of the storm, and abruptly he was in a small, familiar room, one flanked by painted faces. The litter of a picnic spread before them. He wasn't alone. Before him, facing him, a naked figure with a cleft chin and heavy jowls stooped and lifted things high into the air, their juices dappling his face and head with carmine smears, scraps that had been torn from something lying on the floor, which had once been round and smooth with velvet skin and nails the color of flame, something that was now red all over. Diane, her stomach ripped open, intestines spread in greasy ribbons, the proud breasts missing from the wall of her chest, flesh torn from her buttocks, back, the soft flesh of her thighs, delicacies to feed a degenerate appetite, all illuminated by the guttering flame of a wick set in a bowl of rancid human fat light which shone on prominent teeth of a ghoul as it feasted upon the body of the dead. Stephen cried out and lunged forward and saw the creature lunge and turn as they both snatched at the lamp. The flame vanished with the breaking of the bowl to leave only darkness and the crystalline shatter of the window it had broken.